I was debating on whether or not to talk about, you know, why I'm struggling, but I'm gonna. Because if Celine Dion can do it, so can I. So we had a lady named Sean come over. Yes, a lady named Sean. S-H-A-W-N. You know, I don't know what it was short for, but it might just be that's her name. But we're trying to get my dad on Medi-Cal. Which might either get us an in-home caregiver or get him into residential care, which is not like a nursing facility, but it would be like like a group home kind of a situation where there might only be like four other people living there and and the caregivers would live in there so there would be like two people for the group and someone else coming in to help and so he would have 24-7 help whenever um, you know and if he had to be in a long term like rehab facility or something like that would probably be covered the thing is is that instead of being excited I just got really 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 depressed because whenever we've had hope like this put in front of us it's either fizzled out or never happened at all I mean for a while we had a caregiver coming over twice a week but he got another job somewhere else and nobody has come in to fill in his gap so it's back to where we've always been just basically sitting not living life at all I mean when I see people complain about the COVID lockdowns I want to shake them by their collar and go you don't know anything about being isolated I've been doing this for 11 fucking years okay and people who say caregiving is so noble usually have conveyor belts of help of people coming in so they get to be family to their loved one in my house we are doctors, nurses, chauffeurs, nutritionists, pill pushers, physical assistants, butt wipers, you know, toilet commode cleaners, you know, shower givers, you know, toothbrushers, and, you know, like, answering boards, and also an emotional toilet, because he'll take his frustration out on us. So I just, I cannot hope on anything until I see it actually occur and happen. And the thing is, is that my mom does not want him to live anywhere else. And that makes me so mad because whatever she chooses, I get stuck with. And I feel like she doesn't think of me at all. But when I say that, I look like I'm selfish. And I get told I'm selfish. But like... It's my life too, but I feel like it just doesn't matter. And at the rate my mom's going, I don't know if she's going to be alive in two years. Because she's just so mentally and physically destroyed, and I mean, so am I. I'm scared I won't be alive in two years. You know, and if I don't do it by my own hand, it'll probably be some kind of a bodily malfunction that kills me. You know, I don't feel like anything's wrong, but I mean burst aneurysm can kill you without warning that'd be a great way to go you don't even feel it you just drop you know your brain just blood vessel explodes and bleeds out and you're dead in a minute for some people other people they feel it worst headache of their life like a thunderclap very intense pain it's not like oh sudden headache it's excruciating so if you're hypochondriac like me don't worry But, you know, when this Sean lady was here, I went out there and I was voicing my concerns and I said I would rather him be in a residential care, like a group home, just because it would take so much stress off of us. And my mom looked at me like I didn't know what I was talking about. And sometimes my sister Marcy will, will shush me when I try to speak my mind. You know, I get treated like I don't know what I'm saying or don't know what I'm talking about. And it happens so much that I feel like I'm never allowed to say my piece. 
but I'll say it to other people who are outside of the home and it's taken into consideration. So I know this is my family that's the problem. And I'm just so tired. And like, then you wonder, well, how, why do you feel like you don't matter and that, that you're not heard? And this is why. Because the people that need to listen to me won't. I could say it to everybody online and you'd be like, oh my gosh, I so agree. Or that's a good idea. But I talk to my family and they're like, shut up, Cindy. You don't know what you're talking about. And it's like, I'm not looking for an echo chamber, okay? I'm not looking for everybody to, to agree or disagree or whatever. But, like, at least consider what I say instead of immediately telling me to shut up. Because that's what happens. And that's part of my trauma. And I got so triggered today. And also my anxiety about, you know, the future of my mom. And I want to at least, if we do get on Medi-Cal, I want to at least get Dad on a waiting list for one of these residential homes. You know, just because we don't know what it's going to look like in a year. And the wait lists are about a year long. So hopefully he'll be able to stay there for a long time. And not like, oh, they're going to send him back in a year. Because I don't know how it works. I do not understand legal at all. I've tried. It's like politics. I don't understand that either. You know, despite trying, I just cannot grasp it. You know, I'm verbal and articulate, but I'm still autistic, and there are still things that I wish people would explain to me in plain language, instead of this legal jargon. I'm struggling today. I'm going to go listen to that Celine Dion song some more, because I really don't want to cry right now, but I feel like I'm gonna, and I'm tired, and I'm triggered, and my depression is really... That black hole is really big today. And my trauma part and my depression part are fighting. It's sort of. They're rampaging together. And I'm just trying to not get eaten up. I'm tired, but I'm here.